Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cooper Hewitt, um, Smithsonian Design Museum's National Design Week. Thank you for coming. My name is Kim Robledo Diga. I work in the education department here at Cooper Hewitt. Um, I will, on the, on the beginning of this show, I'm gonna, it's gonna kind of get passed along, but I wanted to, first of all, mention that today's Winter Salon is part of our National Design Week, which was started in 2006, and it's part of the celebration of our National Design Award winners program. Um, throughout the whole week, the Education Department runs free programs throughout the week, um, celebrating the designers and sharing their vision and their work with multiple communities, uh, like today's program. Um, be and before we kind of move on, I want to acknowledge some of our wonderful support. National Design Awards programming is made possible by the generous support from Target. Additional support is provided by Adobe. And funding is also provided by Design Within Reach, Altman Foundation, Facebook, Edward and Helen Hintz, and the Siegel Family Endowment. I want to welcome my colleague, uh, Cynthia Smith, who is a curator of socially responsible design here at Cooper Hewitt, who will introduce our National Design Award winners and start our moderator program. So welcome again, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, boy, I'm very pleased to be with everyone here today uh, to have these four stellar National Design Award winners uh, to talk about this um, uh, really broad um, area of design, social good, and equity. Uh, I first want to uh, introduce everyone um, to the four winners. I'm going to start with Gabriel Stromberg on the end. He represents Civilization. They are the 2018 National Design Award winner for Communication Design. Since their founding, Civilization has built identity systems, digital experiences, printed materials, environmental graphics, and exhibitions that are engaging empathetic, sustainable, and create meaningful connections. Uh, we now, uh, next is uh, Gail Anderson. She is a partner of Anderson Newton Design and serves as the creative director at uh, Visual Arts Press, the in-house design studio for the School of Visual Arts here in New York, where she teaches both design and art history. Gail is the recipient of the 2018 National Design Award for Lifetime Achievement. Third, we have uh, Christina Kim, who is the co-founder and designer of DOSA, a clothing, accessories, and housewares company with a focus on rethinking conventional fashion industry uh, production and sustaining artisan cultures. Christina receives this year's National Design Award for Fashion Design. And uh, next to me here is Liz Gerber. She is the co-founder of Design for America, the 2018 National Design Award winner for Corporate and Institutional Achievement. Design for America is a national network of innovators working together to tackle challenges ranging from accessible health care to drinkable water. And they uh, work to improve their local communities through design. So uh, since we have uh, a limited amount of time, um, we're uh, putting this together as a conversation. We look forward to a very engaged and spirited uh, discussion between the four designers today. Uh, they can talk amongst themselves. Uh, there's no order to these. Uh, um, we're not gonna go down the line, but they're gonna uh, answer and uh, speak freely. Uh, we also encourage people in the audience, if you have a question, feel free to interrupt in the middle of this. We do have someone with a um, uh, microphone that we could um, engage you also in the conversation. And we will leave, um, uh, We'll see how the hour goes. We'll try to leave some time at the end for the audience uh, if there's other questions. So let me begin. How do you incorporate issues of social good and equity into your creative practices? And what does this mean for you as a designer and educator? Let the conversation begin. I don't mind starting. Um, 
this is uh, really built into the foundation of our studio. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, uh, really approaching it from a historical perspective. When we first formed our studio, it was, I always liken it to how a group of musicians come together and form a band. Uh, they usually have, you know, other bands that they really kind of bond over, have very similar musical tastes. And uh, we had similar things that we were inspired by in the world of design, uh, specifically in design history. And a lot of those uh, had to do with design being this catalyst for social impact. I mean, everything from silence equals death, uh, the work of Tibor Coleman, um, a lot of the work that's done within the civil rights movement, all these really amazing examples of people using design to create change, to impact the world around them. And we just thought that was so inspiring. And that really, from the very beginning, has been one of the key kind of concepts and foundations of, of our studio. I'll build on that and say thank you. That was really interesting. I, like, like you, Design for America also had the foundation. It was built from the foundation and um, really was actually b built in the local communities. So the vision was to have design studios in every community throughout the country that were really looking in their social community and looking for what challenges and opportunities were very meaningful to them that they could um, approach and use design to um, to solve. So it's really, I, I remark at this question that it's both in the, the mission of our organization as well as even in the structure of the, the design of the organization itself. Uh, I feel like I'm a little late to the game with this because- <laughs> You're not late. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, my background uh, was many, many years at Rolling Stone um, where we were doing a magazine every two weeks for, I was there for about 15 years, and uh, we're doing nothing of any redeeming value to anyone, <laughs> except ourselves in, in a lot of ways. But um, so, but I always felt like because of what I was doing that I needed to find some other way to give back. And uh, because I was working with celebrity stuff and continued to do that at my next job and, and just sort of fun, silly stuff. It, Education became the thing for me um, to, to, to make a different kind of contribution. And so it's been about 30 years or more than 30 years that, I, oh, around 30 years that I've been teaching at SVA. And, uh, and so it's been about um, getting young people involved. And they've got so many options now and to, to show people what's out there and to get them to do the stuff that I wasn't doing at their age. Um, so. Hi. Um, I think for me, you know, I didn't really set out to do fashion. And what I was interested in is just to spending time making things with my hand. And I chose to work in different cultures where the language wasn't common. So the way we engaged and communicated was either doing it together. In many cases, I was learning their skills and then using the skills that I've learned from them, I was able to design with them. So I think through the way I worked for past 27 years, um, it became much more of an equal relationship as a designer and a maker and that there's a great deal of exchange in developing the design. And I think now, looking back, I think the fact that I didn't want to necessarily know what I wanted to do and was interested in spending time making, that I think created an interesting way of working with a designer and a maker. I mean, for you guys, how did you know? Because I, again, I say I didn't know, how did you know it? at 27 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever, that that's what you, you know, that, that, that design could make a difference in that I way, because I didn't. I didn't know at all, but because I didn't have the tools, and my tool was my interest in learning what they do, and you, you understanding the skill, I was able to use my art background to take it to a place that they wouldn't have taken. And generally, I have been working with the same communities and same group of people for past uh, about 15 to 27 years. 
So the, the fact that we've known each other and worked together for so long, that I think we kind of built our own vocabulary of way we work together. And I think it's all because of the time that we spent and not knowing what I wanted to do. Gil, I'll answer that. For me, it was age eight, um, and it was driving eight. See, I was making Partridge Family magazines. Right. <laughs> How did I not know? Well, well, here's what it is, and I credit, it's my grandparents. I mean, it's, it all goes back to the grandparents. So my grandparents moved from um, urban Philadelphia to rural Vermont um, with a distinct mission to build and serve a community up there, a rural community. And so when I was eight, my grandmother and I would go to the bakery, we'd get the day old goods, and then we'd drive around to all the homes that many of them didn't have electricity, very tiny, they didn't have access to cars, and we'd deliver the day old um, goods to the, the community members. And um, my grandparents did that in all sorts of different realms. They'd build things for people. Would I call it service design? Would I call it um, product design at the time? My grandfather making, um, um, in his workshop, making things for community members that were needed? No, but I realized that the idea that, um, that you could consciously intervene and help people in your co community was, was a very valuable um, kind of work. I think it was just Catholic school for me, so I was, yeah. that, that got me given. <laughs> that too. What I think is really interesting is a lot of what we're talking about is the specific choices that we made and uh, the fact that we're working in this space and it's because of these very, maybe sometimes not so at first intentional, but what are those things that maybe you're working in opposition to? I mean, have you ever specifically made those choices where you're, you're you know, I'm going to work doing this that's creating social good as opposed to maybe in other space? kind of making those choices? I have. Um, so um, I moved to California, Los Angeles in 1996. And in downtown LA, there were just fantastic old buildings. And I took this very large space. And you know, I first started in New York in the garment industry, you know, very small spaces, factories was really, really small, showrooms were big, very much divided up in spaces with very little um, air ventilation, or any kind of consciousness for the makers. And so when I moved to Los Angeles and took this 10,000 square feet, one of the first things that I decided to do is have one floor and not create any kind of uh, architectural in, you know, divisions at all. But then the, the, you know, the studio becomes fluid from the design to shipping to making, it all became on the one floor so that we all could be part of the making. And obviously the word I use a lot is making because as a designer, the time that I spend most, most is interested in how we make. And so I think that was the really the big choice that I made. And to think about the, the weather, you know, the light, and not to bring in certain comfort to everyone in the company and make conscious environmental choices. And I think that was a really good a starting point for me to create my own kind of the way I wanted to be as a company. That's interesting that space, uh, I've been to the studios out in uh, Civilization Studios out in, in Seattle to hear you describe this space in uh, Los Angeles. Um, and then even the image I saw here of uh, some of the work that, how does the space that you work in, it's not just, it sounds like not just uh, the connection either with your, uh, the people that you work with, but with your community, how does uh, that environment uh, influence uh, the work that you do. It sounds like it was critical in the middle of it. And I, I would be curious also with civilization, like the, um, that origin story of your spa studio space is interesting too. So go ahead. For me, you know, most of my workers are Latinos. And, um, you know, in the beginning, being in downtown, I didn't realize what kind of impact that it was having with my workers, and they live their lives in downtown LA. So I wanted to make sure that their family, so like on Saturdays, we do overtime, and we work half a day, and I welcomed for their children to come and kind of take about an hour to see what their parents do, 
and be able to go out after their parents' work finished and become, their parents' work is part of their weekend life, even though they had to do work on Saturdays and work overtime, and uh, for the children to be part of what, you know, what their parents were doing. You know, you probably know about garment industry, sweatshops, and that's one of the things that I really wanted to think about. What does that mean when we say sweatshops? How could we change that? And, and for me, it was, it, I'm an immigrant coming from Korea, that that idea of a sweatshop was something that I really wanted to rethink about. And how do I change it? And how do I make my workers feel proud of what they do? And to me, it was the space. For me, space played more of a role of validation. I've been a part of a couple different startups, if you will, design-related startups. And with each one, as soon as we had, and I kid you not, the first closet, because I decided any space was better than no space, um, it, it just it meant it was real. It meant that our efforts were real and the work we were doing was real. And even if we could only fit two, two chairs and a, and a locker in there, it was real. And um, I've worked in a lot of really interesting spaces, including um, uh, a double-wide trailer uh, in, in the, kind of the edge of... Anyway, all sorts of different spaces in an old meat house. Um, and each space has offered a sense of... Um, uh, excitement about and potential for changing existing conditions, particularly the meat house was interesting, um, but thinking about what, what was this used for before and now how can we use it today um, and how can we make it a space that's constantly evolving with our organization as well. Um, I've found that with one organization, the space almost, we, we went through about six iterations, it almost got too precious that we couldn't, um, when, the, when the space got precious, it meant that we couldn't be as playful with the organizational design. So space is very much um, references our process as well. I grew up, live, and work in the city, so I'm happy I have a window. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're also I got nothing. <laughs> but you're 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 part of a uh, this wonderful school, and you're embedded in four this. windows in my office there. So you what? Uh, I have four, four off windows. four windows in my office there. So <laughs> really, I got part of the city. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> so um, I'm going to uh, shift this a little bit, uh, talk about the world at, at uh, large. All of us, I would say, we find ourselves uh, navigating a world of profound change from new notions of truth, polarized discourse, widening income equality, mounting cl climate challenges, uh, to advances in technology from automation to uh, AI. Um, and so what do each of you think the role of designer is in this uh, rapidly changing social, political, and environmental landscape? And uh, to add to that, um, in what ways uh, as has, do you think the designer's role has uh, changed over time? My role as an educator um, is to get the students to really pay attention to what's going on in a way that they sometimes don't. Um, to, to get the spark going, to make sure that they're, again, doing things that I didn't really do at their age. And right now that they're doing something, anything, that they're, that, that they're Aware that like things are really scary right now, and even though they're kids, and I don't want to make it worse for them, I, I I want them to really wake up, and I want them to feel empowered, um, and to to know that they can make change. And it's amazing when you see them do that. And there are so many new courses. There's art and activism that they can take, and um, uh, different master's programs at, at SVA um, to to really get them motivated. So that's, that's my job is like, come on, let's get going, guys. Well, and specifically in the space of visual communication, um, I mean, the way that I see visual communication, it really is a, it's a social transaction, right? There's a giving and there's a receiving. And um, uh, 
I would say, from my perspective, the most successful examples of design are the ones that really use that relationship, um, knowing that what design is doing is it's activating these kind of collective understandings, uh, this, kind of, this kind of collective vernacular. I really see the role of the designer with, within that relationship as one that's there to facilitate meaning and to make it meaningful and to make it human. And um, I think that what I see again and again is as we just, you know, we receive these new technologies, um, the designers are the ones that really go in there and make them relevant, make them meaningful, and, and ultimately make them human. Yeah, I mean, we have a voice now as designers. We, we're not just making cool stuff. We can make change, and that, that's... Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, when, when thinking about what's on the horizon too, right? I mean, imagine what that's going to translate into once designers get a hold of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at Design for America, we have a really unique opportunity and privilege to work with students across all majors. So we have computer scientists who love AI, and we have um, political scientists who love policy. Um, and we're really, what we're trying to do is engage all of them in design work, um, and then and actually work on real problems in the community. And by doing so, the vision is that they don't all graduate and go on to become professional designers. In fact, some of them, you know, some of them go on to be um, every profession in the world. They go into government, nonprofits, um, for profits. And to me, that's the world I want to live in. Is the world in which everybody has exposure and understanding of design, and they bring it to their particular practice. Well, I have been really um, interested in natural resources and how we use to make, let's say, clothing. And first 15 years, I've kind of followed this, you know, traditional way of making, buying fabrics and cutting fabrics and making clothes. But last 25 years, I've been uh, working very closely in the countries and areas where, you know, got to watch how the cottons are grown, how it's procured, how it's hand spun, hand loomed, and handmade. And through that process as a designer, what I really learned is amount of time and amount of hand that it goes in by a maker. So like, for example, you know, I realized what happens in the world of organic cotton versus a conventional cotton. I saw my first, first hand what happens to the farmers, I mean, the spinners who were spinning uh, conventional cotton. And you know, the, because of the um, pesticides and chemicals that was being used, you know, I saw my first hand, first hand, what happens to their hand. So I think what I learned is to look at natural resources and how we procure it. And then once I've learned that, I also re realize the preciousness of the natural material. So the way I used to design, I had to rethink about how do I use the material. So now what, what I think about is I do make a traditional way of making clothing, but we also try to, I also try to really incorporate recycling as part of our practice. So there's a second generation of fabrics that we make out of leftovers. On, on top of that, you know, there's so much of this recycling requires one-of-a-kind work, which allows for me to hire a lot of people who have less skills, but also pay well, but also to you know, incorporate people with great skills and able to add values. And I think this is uh, something that I've been working on and I'm very interested in sharing. We've been collecting data. I, we've been collecting um, what happens, um, you know, when we lose and not add the cost of raw materials, and then how we could change the, this, you know, the income that artisans could make. And so these things all have been happening last five years, and I see that a lot of next generations of designers are very interested in thinking and approaching design from a different place, and that's what I'm interested in really sharing for the future. How does that affect the rest of your life, what you buy, what you drive, what you... Um, I am very conscious of 
how I live and the choices that I make. So I like am very conscious of not using plastic, for example, especially one time use plastic. So I carry my own bottles. And when I travel to bring things for the artisans, I would bring things that I think that would make their lives a little bit more conscious. So last time when I went to India, I brought them all these stainless water bottles for them to have while they are working. Things like that. Yeah, I try to practice it every day in my life because that's the only way I think I could really share truthfully. Well, it's interesting because what, what I'm hearing in everyone's answers are, is basically the concept of responsibility and, and accountability <laughs> uh, within everyone's process. I mean, is that something that's inherent in the role of a designer? No. I think it is now. I don't think it was, of course. And I think that we teach that now. I just came across, I was in class yesterday and came across a quote from Bucky Fuller who said, um, you can, as a designer, you have to make a choice. You can either make sense or you can make money. And this was from, this was, this was a quote in um, Victor Papanek's 1971 Design for the Real World book. And my students and I had a wonderful conversation about that yesterday. And, and we came out with, well, do you have to choose? And, and they, I mean, and I, and I had to remind them, they were shocked by this, especially because I had just presented um, uh, Buckminster Fuller as this renaissance man who, you know, philosopher, everybody respected, et cetera. And they said, but he said something really dumb. Like, how do we make sense of this? Um, anyway, uh, I, think, I, I think I'm right on with you. I think things are changing, and there's, there's an idea that you can do. Yeah, which is so exciting. Which is so exciting. I'd love to hear his comments now. Well, there's a, um, a designer named Eric Carter, and he uh, posted a, an article on the, on the Walker blog. This was a few months ago, and I can't remember the title, but it was kind of railing against uh, designers kind of working in this, this kind of space of kind of like, like hyper-capitalism. And um, one of the things he said was he said, you know, these designers are going in and just by choosing the right typeface, they're elevating a brand value. And, you know, and he was, it was definitely a critique of design in this space, but I remember when I was reading it, I was... I was like, that's incredible. You can actually like, you know, elevate a brand's value just by picking the right typeface. That just proves that design's really, really powerful. Yeah. Not just in that space, but you know, period. So I have to ask a nerdy question. What typeface does your organization use? Uh, like to uh, represent your own brand. Uh, we, uh, just a, a really neutral sans serif. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> for all those font people out there. Well, it's interesting. You bring up this whole idea of uh, responsibility. Uh, do you think the, uh, this new generation of designers feels a stronger sense of responsibility? And I would include in, in that, um, um, because, uh, Christina, you work with uh, people around the world, um, uh, people who are not trained as designers, but the makers. Uh, um, do, you, do you think that they feel a stronger responsibility? Um. I think the people that I work with, you know, um, they have had this skill set that was kind of carried on by generations. And I'm talking about Mexico and India, that's where I work, and China as well. You know, I think they're concerned more about the keeping the tradition going. And I think what I feel is that as a designer, that you could really kind of share the design sense, design thinking to artisans. So therefore, they themselves could become possibly designers as well. I'm not sure that I'm answering your question right. I mean, if I'm going in the right direction for you, but um, so, and I mean, I'm um, I'm very conscious of keeping cer certain kind of traditions keep going in all over the world. So um, the way I see that happening is kind of cr creating an equality with a designer and a maker and themselves becoming possibly designers on their own right. 
Maybe I'll speak to my observation of the first Obama election in 2008. I'm, I live in Chicago, and the, that was very much what was happening um, at the time. And I, along with many others, were really surprised by the, the, the engagement of the youth, um, particularly in politics in a way they had never been before um, around issues that matter to them. And, and I think for me that was a real turning point um, in terms of um, the next generation looking to, you know, and re actively reflecting what's their responsibility um, in their community, what's their response, what are they going to do effectively. Um, I think, so I've seen it, yes, very much, my answer is yes to you. Um, I've seen it in this generation, I'm seeing it more as um, people are getting involved in, more involved in politics um, and more involved in their local community. I think people are feeling much more responsible. Whether they do that through their paid work or their non-paid work is still a question, but um, it does fit in the portfolio of their life. It's interesting because this whole idea of new notions of truth, we have a, um, a couple of people on the panel who work primarily in communication design, and how do you, how are you addressing that within your own work? Um, does it come out, are you explicit or? How does it, are you part of a larger conversation around this? I'm not, quite, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Well, in your own work um, around communication, um, do you embed any kind of new notions of, uh, are you explicit in, in, in trying to convey this idea of, uh, I guess, with algorithms and the conversation that's happening. You're not helping here. Okay. <laughs> algorithms and the well, maybe this, is, maybe this is not a question for, for you. Maybe this is more of a question for uh, Gabriel. Um, I know you uh, engage larger audiences uh, and have, often have a, a position, take a position on different things. Um, does this... Uh, uh, Realize this whole idea, new notions of truth, uh, get realized in, in, in the work that you do? Wait, you, do you mean when you say new notions of truth, do you mean um, the way that... Or the absence of truth, the, yeah. <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> well, I think design is best when it's truthful. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that... Um, and this is something that we deal with every day, just kind of working in the space of technology. Um, and uh, so I think it's an ongoing conversation. Um, I don't think that uh, there, I think that we're all, I mean, in every space that we're working in, we're all kind of confronted with uh, this kind of new reality that's kind of set in. And um, what, I think is going to happen is I think that people are going to understand that they do have the power to change it. Uh, I, I'm actually surprised that it has evolved um, and in a way so in the midst of what seems to be a very kind of like passive acceptance uh, because truth is really important and information is really important. And um, so uh, I, I mean, I think it's, 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 it's really complicated. Well, it's interesting, because you have a studio that also has a gallery space in it. Yes. Um, and you choose to explore different ideas and history and all that. Um, does that uh, come up in what you select to uh, bring out to the public? You know, behind, as opposed to where your studio, you have clients, uh, or you create these public programs. Mm -hmm. um, does it get, it, get it, uh, expressed any, any way within those different uh, venues? Well, so th there are, um, there is so much change happening right now. And uh, we, we connect with a lot of people who are, you know, making that change happen. Uh, and uh, we're really inspired by people working in the space of activism and social change. And a lot of the shows that we feature in our studio center on that. Uh, we've, um, uh, we just had a show uh, by, based on the book by Bonnie Siegler, Signs of Resistance, um, which is about the history of protest. Um, we've also uh, worked with um, Mirko, uh, Mirko Illich and Milton, Milton Glaser. Uh, we did the, uh, 
we did a, a show that was also centered on protest. So we do think that this space is really, really and relevant and an important one. And actually how, the, uh, how this kind of dialogue came about was, you know, we were in the wake of the, uh, the, the, the Trump election and uh, we were all sitting around feeling really sad <laughs> and uh, less than positive. And we were like, okay, well, how can, how can we bring design to this? How can we actually address this with design? And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I, I teach design history. And so I'm actually engaging these types of questions in these types of questions with, with students constantly. And I'm sometimes surprised that they don't see more opportunity to bring design into this mm -hmm. equation. Um, sometimes I think they're so overwhelmed that they're like, it's almost like they're, they, they don't have that aha moment where they're like, wait, I'm a designer. Mm -hmm. This thing that I'm doing is powerful. Mm -hmm. I could actually bring this to the conversation. I have something to add. Um, and so I'm constantly showing them examples of. Yeah, you know, me too. I'm pushing all the time. We have a show up at school right now in the main gallery on the west side, um, Art is Witness, um, political illustration. Um, in this last two years, uh, Adele Rodriguez, Steve Brodner put it together. Uh, it's it's all these great illustrators and designers. Um, it's pretty much a, a Trump show, uh, and it's uh, there's a little social media campaign brewing uh, for the, one of my colleagues that you'll see soon, uh, Tiny Trump, um, and he's he's cut out these tiny Trumps that will be um, planted around the city and around the world in a few days. Um, and we've got some little grassroots things like that going on. So it's, it's like, yes, we're engaging, and, and we're engaging as artists, which is fantastic. Well, there's, that's interesting. So there is this polarized discourse that's happening. We read about it every day. It's right in our faces. Do you think, uh, as um, designers across the, the country, we have Seattle, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, there's ways that we can um, begin to use design to talk to each other. So we have every year Design for America puts on a leadership studio in which we invite our 40 different um, students from 40 different universities to campus as well as some of their mentors and um, advisors. And I have to tell you, it's always such an interesting, and we do a little design charrette and then we do, um, uh, some connection, our, our goal is to have them all connected. So while they work in, across the country, we want this opportunity for them to connect. Um, and what always strikes me is when we're doing the design charrette, how do we frame the, um, how do we frame the design challenge that's socially oriented in a way that's non-political? So for example, we had engagement, we had looking at how can design improve um, uh, the voting experience, as an example. And we're, we're very conscious that people are coming from very different places. Um, and we want to, we know we're gonna have hard conversations regardless of whatever the topic is because people are bringing their own values in. But we're, um, we're ready for it and we're, we're excited to engage. Um, and people report really feeling comfortable engaging, um, especially when they have a, a shared process design. They can, they can talk through um, their different values and perspectives on contentious issues like voting, um, we've done work in education, um, in healthcare, all of those. Um, and it's been, it's been really um, exciting for me to see young people being able to talk with each other with different perspectives, but a shared passion for using design. How do you keep from, from getting political right now when it Oh, can they only get, get political? It gets, it gets political, it's just there, it's, it's respectful and um, it's respect. It's political with respect. Being in the same room, having conversations, um, and I think that's that's what we, quite honestly, to make this a political um, conversation, that's what we need. We need conversation. Um, <clears throat> I, we've been talking a lot about the next generation and and um, and how. Uh, students uh, or um, people that are working uh, in the field um, are uh, thinking about um, all kinds of uh, 
ways to engage. But um, how do you think designers and creatives uh, uh, can increase their ability to make positive uh, change in the future? Do you think there's something gleaned from your experience that um, you would recommend or um, uh, codify or uh, teach your uh, students uh, or your workers or your makers? I am, you know, last few years, um, I have been really interested in kind of communicating my ideas with the consumers. So I have been making workshops for them to understand what it's like to mend clothing or make th you know, small objects that we sell with leftover fabrics. For example, I just did a workshop on Saturday making what we call Corazon Milagros, that the work that I do in Oaxaca, I brought here. I brought scrap fabrics. And it was so interesting to see the different age groups. I mean, we're talking about age starting four years old to 70 years old both young kids to design students, possibly to, you know, museum goers, partaking in making. And I think that's really important for me to share the idea of making and idea of designing that needs to go to your home. It, it can be part of one's life. And I think through that process of by one learning to make, and experiencing things making with hands, I think you make different choices as a consumers because I think as a designer, yes, I think it's really important how we design, but share with the consumers how you can be a consumer. And I think that's one of the areas that I didn't really think about in the past, but last five years I have been definitely thinking about, and I definitely see how um, my consumers have um, become a much more, um, I, I don't want to use the word smart, but um, more informed consumers. And they make different choices, like shopping bags. They refuse plastic bags, and we don't use plastic bags. But already, they, they come with the understanding they are making choices. And I think that's really important for me to share that. I really appreciate uh, Dosa's design and what Christina do with uh, local production in India and other places. I think the message uh, Christina's design deliver is so powerful because it is made of not, not relying on the huge fashion industry. It doesn't have much to do with cat work that's so, so strong on media. And the, the technique and production uh, involved in the making is something very familiar. Like a, it's, a, it's a domestic realm, making fabrics, textiles, making clothes and all those. And Christina's doing uh, traditional uh, traditional production uh, method and with the workers there is so giving me as a consumer message that I may be able to make it or I may be able to participate it. And it's wonderful it's happening in India. And I, I'm a textile conservator at the MAD, so we are very keen to understand what's the production, original production uh, involved, material, technique, technology involved in it. And she is successfully preserving it and also successfully commercializing it and continue to be produced without getting extinct because of the financial pressure. And you wanna say something? Yeah, I do, because I'm, I'm not sure, many of you, but like I grew up making my own clothes. So this is a very recent history that we made our own clothes. So I think it's a fantastic place for me to share with you that you can also make. The concept of making does not necessarily have to be at the level of designer. And that's what's really interest, important for me to share that message that we could all practice being a maker. How much time do you spend traveling out? 
Really bad, but seven months of the year. Th really? That's the question. I want to participate in the making process myself. I live in, I just moved to Westchester from the city, and I found that there are more available resources than the city environment I used to, but still, it's not much production and manufacturing tradition has been preserved around. And I heard remotely in Vermont, somebody's putting, investing somebody's whole life to preserve some old fashioned weaving studio and things. So Christina's doing wonderfully amazing all over the globe. But what do you think about the situation in America? Well, <laughs> you know what? I came here when I was 14 years old. And of course I knew how to sew a little bit, but really, you know where I learned how to sew? Home ec, mm -hmm. in high school. So for me, this is one of the things that I really want to promote, is to bring these classes that are not necessarily academic driven, but life driven, back to school. So, you know, I'm, I've been giving a lot of workshops with a different level of designers and students in different disciplines. Bending, for example. So I, I, I think that is the way to go back, is to bring thinking about school system the education in high school, junior high school level. I'm, I'm gonna add that I think it's not only education, but what you're all doing, and compliments that there are three women and one fabulous man on this um, panel, um, is, is, having more, is, is really having more female role models. I come from a product design background, which is dominated by, by men. And I continually have my students say, you know, we have all these speakers come in, oh, there's another man, there's another man, there's another man. And I, 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 do, I know it's so powerful when we have women come in. Um, Try and, to find a person of color. Yeah, well, that's, the, <laughs> right. <laughs> Jeez, yeah, yeah, very difficult. Um, but I think the more diverse role models we can have, the more young people will say, oh, I, look, I can, I can do that. I can see myself there. But we need, we need the pipeline problem is, is a, big, a big issue for design. I feel like I get that opportunity now, you know, as an older person, as a person of color, as a woman, like, it's my responsibility to do yeah. something, right. you know? Yeah, if so, you don't speak up. Who... Yeah, what I didn't know to do when I was younger, I know now, and this next stage of my career is spent doing that, so. Thank you. You're welcome. We have a, a uh, question over here. Yes, I'm approaching this from interior design perspective, and back to Christina's point and the, um, the comment posed earlier, I think HGTV has done a lot to promote interior design and do-it-yourselfers, yeah. and um, it's kind of taken over my industry in a sense that we are all trying to figure out a different way to really perform our business and to be designers. And to Christina's point, I do think that learning how to sew is a lost trait. It's, a, it's something that I also learned in home ec. Um, my daughter is just peaking an interest in, and I applaud that. I think people need to go back and really learn how to, to do those trades that, or traits, I don't know the right word, but that our mothers did, that our grandmothers and great aunts did, they're, it, they're, it's a lost art. It's a lost art. So I have, I have a very concrete to do for everybody here. If you have children or you don't, it doesn't matter, um, for Halloween, sew your costume. That's what we're doing in my family, we insist. So my eight-year-old son is out there. So if you're looking for something to start doing tomorrow, teach someone to sew their Halloween costume, if you're into Halloween. <laughs> We can take more questions. Are there other questions out in the audience? What about, you know, at school we've got digital embroidery and stuff like that. What, what's, your, what's your take on all? I try to use all medium that's available to do best work. So for example, um, I just finished a project at a museum in Palm Springs. Silk screening, digital printing, hand embroidery, applique, recycling, all of it. And it is about, for me, it's not just a one choice. It is the choice, the best choice for the, 
what is going to look like at the end. And also for me, I like to consider who's making it and what kind of a um, kind of relationship that I could have with them. I tend to work with a lot of men, uh, believe it or not. Most of the embroiders that I work with in India are Muslim men. And um, it's so interesting that we don't consider men can do handwork. I have to say, you know, their skill is so beyond. And, uh, and in my mending classes or the heart making classes last week, the boys were so good at it. I really, ha my hat is off to you men. I think you guys just start sewing. <laughs> really, there is something about the way you approach sewing. And again, there's a slight difference. There is something about it that had a different quality. I, I had to take pictures to keep it. And I can't tell you exactly what, but there is something different. And the boys took it with a different stride. So I was very curious um, why in our culture, the modern culture, men don't sew. Because tailors are men, right? So it's a question. We have a question my over here. My dad sewed and my mother didn't. Let me fix those curtains. I think that's so cool, isn't it? So I have a question for the panel. The panel, um, the broader theme was social good. And so my question to you is, how do you define what is good? Uh, what shapes that definition for you? And how do you um, keep track of your unconscious bias when you are thinking about what is socially good? That's a fabulous question. <laughs> Um, and one, obviously, that weighs all of us down a bit um, because it's, a, it's, a, it's tough. Um, the way I think about it for myself and the way I teach my students to do it is to really simply think of, um, think of all the stakeholders in your design. And what really comes easily to all of us are the ones who are going to benefit. Oh, it's this person and this group and that group, et cetera, um, and benefit in some, um, social, in some socially oriented way. And then, um, then we think about who's going to negatively be impacted by this, um, and that's harder to. That's a harder conversation to have, but um, important to discuss. Let's say, what would happen if we if we develop this um, new product or service? Who's going to be negatively impacted? Who's going to lose a job? Who's going to um, have more traffic in their neighborhood? You name it. Um, I, I even think with all your traveling, I was I was just notif noted told the other day that um, by environmentalists um, that actually airplanes are significantly, the travel that we do as leaders <laughs> is um, one of the, the worst um, environmental impacts we can possibly have um, and outdoes every other attempt we have. And it's been making me really think what, what's the trade-off I'm making to be physically here versus on a screen talking to you all. Um, and. Um, who are the yeah? Who are who's benefiting from this and who's not benefiting from this? Um, and trying to decide, given my values at that time, what what the best trade off is. Um, I'm not going to lie to you that I think every action that we take positively impacts some and negatively impacts others. I think to think otherwise is is false. I don't mean to look at you. <laughs> I'm I'm just ready for somebody else to. Yeah. Take on this. I'm I'm desperate for a, a new approach. If you have one, I want to learn. Well, I feel really lucky. Our studio, all of the clients that we work with, we believe in what they're doing. Uh, we really let our principles guide us, and so that's really how we define, you know, what we consider positive social impact. Um, I mean, and that's everything from you know working with uh, an organization uh, focused on uh, climate change an organization, an activist organization uh, centered on women's reproductive rights, uh, a, um, a many, many cultural organizations. All of the people that we work with, we actually have this personal connection to. And uh, so the result is the work that we do, we're very personally invested in. And I really do think that's kind of the, the kind of defining thing about our studio. Uh, and I 
So I think that that's how we're kind of making those decisions. That's how we're defining what, what that means to us. You know, I like being part of an organization. I like being part of School of Visual Arts, being part of a college and in an art school in particular. Um, that's, that's been great these last few years. Not, I've always been involved in the teaching part, but to be on the administrative side and to feel like the things that we're creating at Visual Arts Press for incoming students, for existing students, and anybody interested in art. Um, that I, I feel like I know this audience really well, and and uh, it's a, it's a pleasure to be working for that audience. Um, I, I love the other audiences I've worked for, but this is different. This is like I can help to get a kid to make this amazing decision to go to college and change their life and all that, so. And, and just listening to you talk, you can, you can hear that personal connection. And I think it's interesting, I've, I've gotten snippets of that from everyone's responses tonight, that everyone is just so personally invested in, in what they're doing, and that really is a key thing that drives the decisions that they make and the choices that they make. I think for me, like we said, that I, you know, I travel a lot. Um, one decision that I've made is slow the process down and to really analyze every decision I make, which could be, let's say, in a case like going to India and work. It's been interesting because I decided not to go to India as often as I do, and once I go, I stay much longer, that's one. And um, try to communicate with the modern technology, which is computer. And so, kind of a created this dialogue via email. And what's happened by making choice not to travel as much as I do, I think, without realizing it, they are becoming now having to make the design decisions. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I think, I think they are, um, kind of gaining design sense by me slowing down the process. And I see that um, there's a lot of a creative element that is coming in that I didn't expect it before, which I'm so grateful for you know, thinking about what kind of impact that we make as a designer who has to travel and work and fly around. And I think being able to slowing down, I think that has been the best kind of new way of looking at how to be has been a great help for me. And it sounds, it sounds like you're empowering them. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. so. for sure. And um, I think we've run out of time. I think that's a great note to uh, end on, empowerment and uh, slowing down, especially here in New York City. I love this During National down. Design <laughs> uh, Week. Um, so I want to thank um, our uh, National Design Award winners, uh, Gail Anderson, Christina Kim, Civilization, and Design for America. Join me in thanking thank you. Them.